give Suzanne a chance to get up here. All right, I believe that you are fortunate enough to have another quiz. Um, we can't really see it too well, but this is the North Korea panel, so no surprises, this is the North Korea quiz. Um, I think by now you all know how to join the polling, uh, but I will read the questions. I cannot see it, so um, I'm just gonna read the questions and hopefully they match what you're seeing. Um, over the next two years, how are the United States and North Korea most likely to interact? A, more of the same, talk, talk, lots of talk, but no significant change. B, direct negotiations. C, U.S. military strike in North Korea. Or D, North Korean military strike on U.S. territory or ally. I can't see it well, but it <laughs> looks like the answers are coming in pretty strongly for more of the same. 80-20. You're all so cynical. Did you come in cynical, or has it just been the effect of the day? No. That's the optimistic answer. Oh, right. Well, <laughs> which is a perfect segue to this wonderful panel that I'm delighted to chair. Um, I'm Sharon Burke. I'm a senior advisor at New America and a former defense official. So that's where I'm coming from. I'm going to give you a quick introduction to our panel, and then we're just going to jump right in. First, we have Dr. Sumi Terry, who is, uh, let's get your official title now, Senior Fellow Career Chair at CSIS. Um, but what you need to know, too, for the purposes of this panel is that Sumi spent a great deal of time as the ultimate insider. She was uh, an intelligence analyst and then was a White House advisor in the National Security Council for Korea um, for both President Obama and for President George W. Bush. So she's been the consummate insider and is a recognized expert in our government on U.S. government policy and on Korea. So we're very fortunate to have her here today. Next to her, we have Suki Kim, who is, let's see, um, well, let's see how what your official, okay, well, that's what I was going to say. Um, she's a New York Times best-selling writer who wrote a book called Without You, There Is No Us, which was from her time as an undercover reporter in North Korea, which no one has ever done before. She was there for a year, right? Six months. Six months. Felt like a year, at least, I'm sure. <laughs> um, for six months, totally undercover as a teacher. Um, so she has a point of view that really is unusual, um, and we're lucky to have her here today. She's an award-winning writer, a contributing editor, editor to New Republic, um, also has a fiction book that's award-winning, so this is a very versatile reporter, um, a very different point of view. And then we have our own Suzanne DiMaggio, who is a senior fellow at New America and directs several different projects. And you know, we talk a lot about war fighters, and we have a whole system in the Department of Defense for recognizing excellence. But we don't talk a whole lot about peace builders and the people who are out there waging peace and you know, what kind of medals do they get, they get. But if we did, this would be someone who would be up on a pedestal. Suzanne is setting the pace on a, a quiet world of track two diplomacy with Iran, with North Korea, with China, with Myanmar. Um, and if you don't know what track two is, it means where we can't have government to government official negotiations. Suzanne is leading the way on how we talk to these governments in the, these people, this polity, in a time when we don't have official dialogue. So um, she's an important person nationally and for New America, so glad to have her here. Let's dive right in. So I'm going to ask each of you a question, and I'd like us to get into a conversation, and then if the audience looks interested enough, we'll let them ask questions too. <laughs> so first, Sumi. Yes. Um, North Korea, tell me how it looks to the United States, war in North Korea, what we should expect. How does it look to us, to our government? Well, to our government, obviously, you, North Korea is seen as a major threat. Um, you've seen both all the ballistic missile tests last year. I mean, since Kim Jong-un came into power, really, 90 ballistic missile tests, 90 missile tests, four nuclear tests, hydrogen bomb nuclear tests, three ICBM intercontinental the ballistic missile tests last year. So it was looking like increasingly that um, North Korea was on its way to completing its nuclear program, perfecting its nuclear arsenal, which means, of course, having the capability to attack mainland United States with nuclear-tipped intercontinental ballistic missile. Mike Pompeo, then CIA director, uh, now new Secretary of State, said just a couple of weeks ago um, that North Korea 
from uh, intelligence perspective was within months away from having this capability. Now that timeline is disputed. Uh, we, you know, we know uh, other folks who might say, no, no, this, they need a longer timeline before they can put it all together. Regardless, uh, North Korea is really a few technical holders away, really one more step away, which is really showing a successful reentry capability, and then they will be able to have this capability. Now, so what? Um, one can argue, um, okay, we live with nuclear China. If we said Mao was crazy, we live with nuclear China, we live with nuclear Russia, nuclear Pakistan. Is this something that is such an overwhelming threat that we cannot live with nuclear North Korea? And I think that was a debate um, that was continuing just before the summit is like, can we live with nuclear North Korea? And from this administration's perspective, you can argue this. Um, one of the reasons why some folks have argued that we cannot is because they believe that once North Korea has this capability, their, their actions in the future will not be, become passive or they're set and they're, they're gonna just calm down. In fact, their, uh, their actions can get more aggressive, which means more conventional, because they'll be more arrogant, more confident, um, so maybe more conventional uh, pro attack or cyber. Uh, there's gonna be more problems and that North Korea's intention it's not only just passive or it's not necessarily just deterrence against the United States, but North Korea has more aggressive design, such as trying to decouple U.S.-South Korea alliance over the long term, try to get the U.S. forces off the Korean Peninsula, to achieve unification on its own terms, and so on. So for these reasons, I think the argument was, and again, it's debated among Korea Watchers community and the policymaking community, but this is where the administration was headed. This was just not gonna be acceptable. And just one more thing is, um, proliferation risk. That okay. one of the biggest unacceptable risk uh, of North Korea is that as they mass produce, the risk goes up for proliferation, and that is a real risk because North Korea is a serial proliferator. It has proliferated absolutely everything under the sun. That is a fact. Even just recently, you've seen reports about Syria-North Korea connection. I mean, we know North Korea helped you build Syria a nuclear reactor, which the Israelis bombed, and they had a big New York Times spread on that. Uh, but just even the chemical weapons assistance and so on. So for all of these reasons, we're seeing it as something that was unacceptable, and we're headed in this direction. Do we take them seriously as a threat? Are we concerned about their capabilities? Yes, um, but not necessarily because we think North Korea is going to attack us. Even the biggest hawks in, in our administration, I don't necessarily think we, those people think that North Korea is here to attack us um, or, or uh, first attack us because I think almost everybody knows that Kim Jong-un is rational. Um, he might be ruthless, we know that. I mean, we look at how he killed his half-brother and uncle and so on. Clearly, he's a ruthless guy, but there's no sign that he's suicidal or he's ideological. He cares about regime preservation. He cares about continuing his regime. He cares about living or, you know, hold his life and die of an old age like a normal dictator. So in that sense, North Korea is not attacking us, but still, the risk is proliferation risk uh, and the, the more aggressive actions in the future, like decoupling U.S.-South Korea alliance. Okay, we'll come back to this, yeah. too, about more about some of their other capabilities because yeah. yeah. the focus has been on the nuclear side. So right. we're not even talking cyber, chemical, right. biological, right. Um, right? Where they're good, they're good. Right. Otherwise, we'll be here for an hour. <laughs> yeah, but where they're yeah. good, they're good. Is yeah. that fair to say? They're just not good at all that much. Uh, what do you mean they're good at some things? Certain capabilities that they have yeah. focused yeah. development yeah. and money on, yeah. they're pretty good at. Oh yes, yeah. They have, we just know they have robust. Uh, biological and chemical weapons program. We know that their cyber capabilities obviously even increasing. They're spending a lot of money and effort uh, on, on expanding cyber capability. We know their conventional military capabilities very high. Now we are adding to that. We have a nuclear missile program. So, so that's that's how. So the U.S. takes them seriously. They're not a top tier threat in the new national defense strategy. They're sort of the second tier, yeah. um, but still we take them seriously. Um, that's how we, as a polity, look at them. Um, I wouldn't say that more popularly in the United States population, people think about North Korea a ton. Probably not, but certainly in Although our 2017, it fell to me like a ton <laughs> last year. Okay. But, yeah. But I just mean yeah. in the popular yeah. imagination. Right. right. It's a different story in North Korea, though. How does North Korea look at the United States, and especially at the prospect of going to war? Well. Um, the way North Korea works is that it's, um, you know, that idea of, because I think from our perspective, 
we think that societies are built on the concept of peace, or that's the ultimate goal. Um, I think that from my understanding of North Korea, the more and more and more I um, dug deeper into it, which uh, by the time I lived there undercover, it had been a decade of uh, multiple visits and also just trying to understand it from every perspective, um, from defectors to you know just all the other side. Um, but it's actually not built on the concept of peace at all. You know, it's founded on um, the, the Korean War, which America had cut up Korea Peninsula. So going from that, if actually America is the enemy that created uh, this North Korea really was one of the reasons, then North Korea does, uh, the reason the great leader has been able to have this power, which just is a monopoly for three generations, is because actually of the American threat and the imminent war that is just always there. So, and that myth is just in everything. You know, I think that we think somehow there's like a concept of war and there's life, but there are, the life is actually all about war. So even when I was living there as a, a you know, my cover being an evangelical teacher with this young man. It was, um, so when I was li living there, the, my students were 20 year old uh, future leadership because every other school in North Korea in 2011 were shut and all the university students were sent to the construction field for an entire year except for 270 young men. So these were the young men I lived with. So they were the creme de la creme. And we celebrated the victory day in July big celebration among us. So what is this victory day that made absolutely no sense, obviously, because what war are we talking about that North Korea won? But, you know, because in their a foundation myth, the original great leader Kim Il-sung won the war. Uh, so the Korean War is won by Kim Il-sung, um, which of course doesn't make sense, since if they won, then there shouldn't be this 38th parallel in DMZ, clearly. So it logically it makes no sense, but because they celebrate that, Kim Il-sung was able to win this war, but Americans are right on the other side, and they're gonna attack us any second. So I think this concept of war, I mean, was, you know, I mean, my students call the classroom platoon. Um, there's a phrase for every, like, the authors of the green room here, like uh, where we are, speakers are sitting, for example, that would be in North Korea, uh, called Chantujang, uh, which means, actually a battlefield. And that phrase is because it's a workplace. So office, if you go to office, office would be called a battlefield, right? So I mean, it's in just their psychology. So I think that if this is how their regime has actually been built around the concept of war, you can't really separate the two. And that war will be started by the United States. So it's directly linked to the foundation of that regime. And also in North Korea, regime is not just a government. Regime is everything. Regime is the reason you exist. So, I mean, I think that we don't really think that way, but. No, I think you told me it really caught my attention that it's like a giant prison camp, the entire country. Entire country, and it's also, I mean, it's, it's you know, because we think that there is, um, like, we might think about the president, but we also have other things to do in life that's not just politics. Um, but there, it's everything, which is why most young men, other than the elite, serve the mandatory service, army service of uh, generally about 10 years. And that basically means every young man between the ages of 17 and 27 are in the army. So that's basically the nation who are not developing in any way just because they are all in an army. Um, so when I was, you know, I wasn't ever really interviewing my students because their answers always come propaganda answers. But some things they'll say that'll slip, it was very clear. Uh, it depends, those 10 years are for non-elite, it's 10 years, but for elite, some of them still, their brothers were in the army and those brothers never came home. Like maybe once every three years or something. So it's not just an army, it's also the brutality of army is everything. Like you don't go home and you don't 
develop other things like family relationships or friendship or romance. I mean, the, so what I'm trying to say is psychology is just entirely built around this concept of serving the great leader. And you also education is missing because you can't really have full education if you only teach about the great leader. So that's a cult system that is built around war. Okay, so Suzanne, you've been directly meeting with North Korean officials. How is it possible? I mean, I really wanted you to, to back clean up because this doesn't sound bridgeable. Mm -hmm. But you've been having those conversations. Do you think it's possible to bridge this divide? It doesn't sound like it to me, but. Um. Well, I'm an optimist, so I have to think it's possible. And given the work I do, I have to think it's possible every day. But I am um, concerned. And in terms of the North Korea's mindset, it doesn't surprise me at all that they're ready to come to the table now. Yes, the Trump administration can tout uh, maximum pressure, uh, sanctions is what brought the North Koreans to the table, but that's only one piece of this puzzle. The reality is it's the advancements that Sumi outlined. The fact now that uh, North Korea has um, a very, uh, sophisticated nuclear program and delivery system. And let's keep in mind, even though they may not have the reentry capability to hit us here in Washington today, they can hit Seoul at any moment. They can hit my relatives in Tokyo at any moment. So they do have a, they have already uh, achieved a deterrent capability. Um, so that is really, in my estimation, the main reason why they're coming to the table now. Uh, they have this program. They see it as a deterrent. They see it as a way f to keep the U.S. from attacking it, from regime change. And they also see it as this is their peak negotiating position at this moment. And they know that. Uh, so they're, they're very smart about that. Uh, and I would say the other reason they're coming to the table is due to the uh, deaf diplomacy of President Moon and South Korea. Uh, they've brought us to this point uh, where uh, they are embarking on inter-Korean dialogue um, going forward. Now, when I think about the future, it does, I have a number of concerns, especially around the summit, and uh, one of them is the expectations, I think, are quite different on both sides. And my hope is that there is a robust interagency process happening here in this town preparing for the summit, which it looks like now is going to slip to June, which is probably a good thing. Uh, and my um, hope is that even before Kim Jong-un and, and Trump get to the table, that they have already uh, worked out um, the, thing, the points of agreement, the principles that they're going to follow. That's my hope. Um, but at the other side of this is a real concern that I think President Trump is going to want to get two things out of this summit, two main things. The first one doesn't concern me too much, and that is he's going to want to emerge from this summit saying, I achieved peak chemistry with Kim Jong-un. He wants to be he able to that? say, yes, okay. I think he wants to be able to say, <laughs> I've achieved something that no other U.S. president has been able to do, and that is to form a relationship with a North Korean dictator. The second thing is when we're, where we're going to run into problems, and that's the expectations around denuclearization. I think he's going to want to come out of this meeting and be able to say, uh, I got Kim Jong-un to, to agree to denuclearize. But as you've all read in the papers today, there are different conceptions of what denuclearization means. So how do we bridge that gap? That's what concerns me. The other thing is I'm worried that uh, President Trump will come to the table with a deal, an offer, saying this is it, you denuclearize, and in return you get this, and that's it. Uh, not much of a uh, dip diplomatic process, in, in other words. So I give the administration and the president credit for stepping back from the brink of war, because let's not um, mince words, uh, the talk of military action was quite serious, especially a preemptive strike. And now to take a step back and choose a diplomatic path is noteworthy. But um, at the end of the day, unless there is a um, successful outcome, and we can talk about what, how to measure success, my, my biggest concern is that 
the expectations aren't reached, uh, diplomacy is deemed a failure, and then where are we left? Um, I'm afraid we'll be left at a spot where um, the prospect for future diplomacy um, is badly damaged, perhaps even in an irreversible way, and then suddenly all those military options that have been uh, deemed unviable suddenly look unavoidable. So there's a lot to manage here, and given the ch musical chairs in our national security team, some of those chairs are happening, are switching today, as a matter of fact, um, we also have to question whether the U.S. has the capability to embark on what could be the diplomatic negotiations of this presidency. In, in your talks with North Koreans, you, you talked about expectations. Have you gotten a clear sense of what they want or what they think they want? Uh, there's mainly a several things that they want. One, of course, is um, a reduction in sanctions. Sanctions relief, I think, is the main thing that they want and what they need economically. So that's probably the driving force. The second thing is a threat reduction from the U.S., uh, either in the sense of reaching a peace treaty with the U.S., because technically we are still at war with North Korea. We only have an armistice. Uh, some adjustment in the military exercises, which we're already seeing, mm -hmm. and maybe even some adjustment in troop um, uh, levels on the peninsula. Beyond that, I think, um, you know, at a, a recent meeting, they, they threw a new one in, which I hadn't heard before, and that was they want President Trump to uh, lower his rhetoric and stop his insulting tweets. Uh, so that's part of the hostile uh, policy now, according to <laughs> the North Koreans. And that may be the toughest one to yeah. <laughs> Well, I was gonna luck. say, <laughs> good luck with that. I was gonna say, especially you alluded to the, the uh, ascendance of John Bolton, who uh, started his job today as yes. a national security advisor. Now he's made no secret uh, that he he's, uh, favors military options for North Korea. So my next question for all three of you is, so what does war look like on the peninsula? If, if, we, if diplomacy fails and we do go, um, it, I'd like to hear what you think war looks like. Should I go first? Sure. Um, and feel free to sure. jump in. Um, well, it's, it'll be catastrophic um, because I think the assumption under this bloody nose and even limited military strike was somehow this irrational Kim Jong-un that you can, was not rational enough to live with in terms of nuclear North Korea, going to act rationally and not retaliate when there is this limited strike. Um, I worked as CIA for a number of years working on this. I will tell you one thing that we do not know, that we have no handle on, is what Kim Jong-un will do or not do. So my response to that line of thinking is you might be right. Because it, the, the point is like there was a lot of provocations from North Korea in the past. They have never de been met with proper response. And we have to show that we're serious this time. I get that frustration, except that we have no way of knowing to say that Kim Jong-un is not going to retaliate. And then once he retaliates, that will lead to escalation. I mean, Congressional Research Service came up with a report that talks about the potential casualties, right? And even when Lindsey Graham said if thousands are going to die, they're going to die over there, I mean, which is a very unfortunate statement to make. We're talking about our allies, after all. But we do, let's, I want to remind everybody, we do have 250,000, 230,000 Americans living in South Korea at any given time, another 100,000 in Japan, right? And how do you even evacuate these guys? Last time we had this kind of evacuation, this level, I mean, 60,000 in 1975 during the Vietnam War. And when you look at the Korean Peninsula, the east and south are under missile threat. So you have to go through the West and through China. There's a million Chinese living in South Korea. So logistically, it just doesn't even make sense. Um, and obviously, it'll be catastrophic consequences. Um, just to reinforce your comment about it being sort of a black box, the slide that just popped up um, on the screen is the Korean Peninsula from the International Space Station. And that bright node you see in the lower part, like that looks like a synapse firing, is Seoul. Mm -hmm. And then up north, uh, all the bright lights is China. That's actually North Korea black in between. And it's again, it's a, I, I'm sure people have seen this kind of thing before, but it's never, it's good to remember what we're talking about. 
it is literally a black box. And right. by the way, just, just since you've been looking at a map, I mean, look at the proximity. There's 14,000 conventional artillery troops zeroed in in Seoul within 60 seconds of, away from Seoul. Look at the distance there. So I think this is an agreement, uh, assessment that almost everyone will give you, that it's to just contemplate military confrontation with North Korea is just catastrophic. Yeah. It's, a not, it's not a viable option yeah. when we're not facing an imminent threat. And I know some people would argue with that, but I don't see that. So I agree with Sumi. I think in terms of be massive casualties, um, incredible destruction, uh, enormous disruption to our global economy. I think Secretary Mattis put it best. He said um, it would be a level in terms of human suffering, yeah. a level that we haven't seen till, since 1953. So at this stage of the game, uh, since we are not facing an imminent threat, uh, my point of view is we have to um, pursue and exhaust every avenue of diplomacy to try to reach some sort of uh, um, agreement or set of agreements where we can um, either learn to live with, nu with a nuclear North Korea that is under um, inspection uh, and bound by other agreements or find a way to uh, entice them to denuclearize. But I have to admit at this stage of the game, I think the latter option is uh, not in the cards in the immediate future. And this is another area of disagreement that I see the uh, Trump administration having, uh, not only with the North Koreans, but with Seoul. I think Seoul sees denuclearization as a process that will unfold over time, mm -hmm. that time frame to be determined. And I'm, I think the Bush administration probably sees it as something that has to happen tomorrow. Uh, Trump administration. As the Trump administration. What did I say? Bush administration. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> Projecting. <laughs> It, well, this does come in cycles. Yes. <laughs> um, Suki, I want to change the question a little bit. So, but I do actually, you know, that whole idea of human suffering. Yes. And of course, war on the peninsula, um, the Korean War from 50 to 53, and you know, if you were to repeat now, of course, it would be even more unfathomable. Um, I do think that Kim Jong Il, Kim Jong Un, what would he do? You know, regime is everything there, right? It's not, right. there's literally nothing but the regime in that nation in many sense. Um, and the citizens are just tools to maintain that, that regime. So I think that any uh, real efforts for regime change would only cause war. I don't really, because the regime is just simply not going to withstand. Um, I think that. War as a possibility is a very real possibility if there is a real effort for, for overthrow that regime. Um, I think that human suffering, since 53, it's just there is nothing to this degree. I don't think anything is comparable to what's been going on well, in North Korea. Let me Korea. ask you a pointed question along those lines, because you're talking about right now, status quo without any kind of military action. Is peace possible with North Korea, with this regime? I think that what is what has been continuing there for its citizens, 25 million people in there, uh, where literally none of them can really move. There's no uh, movement. It's like people stuck in a rotten water just serving the great leader. So I'm not just talking about famine and gulag. I'm talking about, you know, like the creme de la creme. I mean, how little freedom they had. They uh, weren't allowed to know anything, um, go anywhere, do anything. And I think that level was unfathomable to me. Um, I had even a decade of research into North Korea when I actually lived there, I hadn't expected. We always assumed the elites have it better. That is not what I found at all. Um, so peace, how is that possible? I don't really understand how this kind of society is allowed to exist all this time. That's really, it's 70 some years. Mm -hmm. So it's almost like trying to separate, you know, if we're talking about like Nazi Germany, concentration camps, you can't really separate that issue from human rights issue. It's just a politics and human rights is together in that issue. And it's kind of like that with North Korea. So what's been allowed to exist all this time is unthinkable. So what's there right now is 
not peace, although there is no war yet. So I do think it's kind of that in-between place. Um, peace, I mean, I don't really see any other way except somehow trying to have that country fall apart on its own Following from information. The way I look at it is I, when I visit North Korea, I, I think of it as it is on perpetual war footing. Everyone there is thinking about the threat. And so what, one of the things that interests me most is if these negotiations proceed, if the summit happens and let's um, hope for the best, how will this regime that's been um, so focused on fighting the enemy, which is us, suddenly if we're less of an enemy, how does it justify the policies or the way it treats its people that Suki just outlined? Um, I mean, that seems like it's going to be a massive challenge, mm -hmm. and how will they address that? And I'd like you, also, if we have questions, now is your moment, so raise your hand, and uh, the microphone is here, and you're here, so you can go first, but I would like you to think about this, yes. too, about what does war look like. Please introduce yourself. Hi, uh, good afternoon. My name is Lieutenant Colonel Scott Smithson from the Joint Staff, and I thank you all for the panel today and the conference. Didn't get a chance to ask the last panel as to where they think the direction for the JCPOA will go and its impact in the region in the Middle East. But obviously, this issue is going to be revisited before the summit uh, with KGU and President Trump. And so I just would welcome the panel's thoughts as to how much the regime is kind of would be monitoring those discussions if they see those as linked or uh, separate in their decision making. I think, I think you just threw a softball right at Suzanne. So. Yeah. Um, I have to say, every discussion I've had with a senior North Korean official, uh, the JCPOA has come up. And just two weeks ago, my last meeting with an official, it was brought up. And one of the things he said was, if we reach an agreement with this administration, how can we be assured that they will follow through on it, number one? And number two, that the next administration won't just turn it over. So this is something that they're watching very carefully and very closely. Uh, they also see how uh, isolated the United States has become uh, with this administration failing to certify the JCPOA and maybe by May 12th pulling out of it altogether. Uh, they're very, um, I think it's been instructive to see how the Europeans and of course China and Russia have really come to the defense of the Iranians on this point, and, and make no doubt about it, they're learning from that, and they're watching it very carefully. My last point on this is, this is such a missed opportunity by the Trump administration, because when you look at the JCPOA, its major innovation is it's the most intrusive uh, inspections regime ever negotiated. The verification system is um, beyond anything we've ever seen. So the administration should be going to the North Koreans and saying, look at this agreement. It's 160 pages long. This verification system is our gold standard now. This is the precedent has been set, and this is what we're going to do from now on with every uh, nonproliferation agreement we reach. That's what this administration should be doing. But to be honest, even before this, I mean, North Koreans also bring up you know, the change of the administrations and scrapping the deal. They talk about the WEF framework and the Bush administration came in. So they are used, they say, well, we get it, you are a democracy, you have changed in systems, so we can change in administrations and we cannot really trust you. But they cheated, yeah. the Iranians didn't. Right, right. But my point is, but I think what the Trump administration actually is thinking, or if I can speak, for, I, I could, I should have. Feel free. Yeah, but, <laughs> Um, that they might think that, it, what they're trying to say, look, North Korea, they think somehow it's the opposite, that they can somehow strengthen its hands, and we, even Iran deal is not good enough, so we need a much, I mean, I'm just trying to explain the administration's perspective that this is like, they are not trying to go for, like, they see it some sort of as a sign of strength, or a way to sort of really force North Korea. Um, I was, can I just give you, a, can you tell the North Koreans that um, <laughs> if you have a deal with this team, there's no other administration that's gonna come in and scrap a deal that's gonna be made with. This is gonna be the most hawkish team that's, you know, that's gonna sign any deal. Just tell the North Koreans that nobody else is gonna come in and scrap the deal. Okay, <laughs> done. <All right. laughs> yes, in the back. Hi, T.S. Allen, I'm an Army officer, previously served in South Korea. 
Um, in the aftermath of World War II, there was a great Japanese writer named Surumi Kazuko who argued that uh, the sort of fundamental reason that Japan fought so differently from the other combatants in the Second World War and sort of it fought in a, in a shock-centric way rather than a fire-centric way was that uh, the Japanese people had experienced such intense socialization for death uh, in the 1920s and 30s. Um, a fascinating series of essays on, on sort of how culture can totally change the way that a nation fights and equips for war. Um, one of the things that I'm very interested in when I, I think about North Korea is how, on the one hand, they seem to be very socialized for death. Um, it, it seems that, you know, the way that North Koreans down in the Kaesong Heights think about what a war with America would be like, there's a lot of sacrifice involved. But on the other hand, they're very technically focused military. They have a lot of artillery. They now have nuclear weapons. They certainly don't prepare for war like a nation that would fight that way. Um, so I was wondering if you could comment on sort of, you know, how the North Korean idea of sacrifice affects the way that they would fight. Um, and, and also particularly, Ms. Kim, if you could comment a little bit on how maybe that's different in Pyongyang from down in the South Four Corps, uh, sort of how people see their relationship with the regime and their willingness to sacrifice it differently. Thank you. Suki, do you want to take that? Do you mean their idea of sacrifice? Sacrifice, and because you did talk about the culture of war. Mm -hmm. um, does that include war at all costs? There was just nothing, but war is the reason they exist. War is the reason that the great leader is great. Um, other than that, there really was, and, and sacrifice, you know, because they're ultimately tools for the great leader. But there's actually like a very popular song that my students sang all the time, how all of them are bullets in this giant machine for the great leader. But that's literally how they're, I mean, but the thing is, I think that when we think about that idea a very sophisticated way, we could make all different analysis about it intellectually, but from their perspective, there's nothing else. I mean, this is what makes it a cult. Right? Like if you actually think about philosophy or literature or mathematics or history, then you can start thinking about how logical such a sacrifice is or is this doable. But they actually don't have um, any other information but this, which is they sacrifice the, for the great leader. And also another thing is the concept of thinking critically is a thing that's discouraged for not just this generation, for three generations in a row. So you need to be able to think about it proactively and also think about it in a more levels. And I think that capacity has also been wiped out very actively, aggressively in people. So um, from the regime, so, and how are the people that are in that I was able to uh, glimpse in that time that I was living in, was it very different from actually uh, so many defectors that are interviewed in all different regions. You know, I went to Mongolia, Thailand prisons, or the Chinese border in hiding places in Seoul after they've escaped, a year after they escaped, you know, all different stages to try to get an analysis of what the life in North Korea is like. But when I actually lived amongst them where they didn't have to turn around and tell me the story afterward, but actually when I was in the system with them and they didn't think that I was writing this stuff down as a reporter, then the reality of their psychology that I was glimpsing was devastating because there literally was nothing else. Then things that I was very mystified when I would do interviews with defectors for so many years kind of started making sense. You know, and that's all very, in a way, like a larger thoughts. The idea, the inability to tell the truth is another thing. Inability to make sense, uh, like logically, time timeline was also, and now I understood why, because they're never told how specifically some things happened in what year, for example. Their newspaper, if you look at it, the Nodong Shimmun, it'll never quite clearly say what dates events happened when. So, I mean, it's just in every aspect of their culture. It makes you unable to think on your own. So, are people in Pyongyang specifically different from the rest of North Korea? From my uh, estimation, from researching this, I just think this is the way most of their society works, except those by the Chinese border and some defectors that flee and those who have an access to the outside world, what their stories are, I think, actually different from the way, because when you also think about it logically from our point of view, if it wasn't like that, this country could not be the way it is 75 years now. Like, it is 
right now the most isolated world, place in the world. We've got time for one more question. Um, this gentleman right here. Would you, and just quickly, Sumi, comment on that, um, because you probably did a lot of looking at um, political military dynamics, and you know, was was there any indications of unrest of of you know, or was it politically coherent in the way that Suki is describing? Well, it's, I mean, she she's absolutely right. It's the most frightening, frighteningly ideologically indoctrinated cultish place on the planet. Um, so I think really hard for us to just have a perspective on what it's really like. Um, I mean, North Koreans are the ones who get punished if their portraits of their dear leaders at home are not dusted off properly, right? If there's a fire, you need to go run and save the thing. So if North Korea is under attack in terms of war, you know, the sacrifice mentality, um, it's, I think it's, that's, that's what's been instilled in them since the moment you were born. And I'm sorry I faked you out. We don't actually have time for oh. your question, but I would encourage you to talk to our panel <laughs> later. Um, Suzanne, just a last word. Do you remain optimistic? You said it before. Mm. I'm cautiously optimistic. I mean, and I think Why? we have to be <laughs> at this stage of the game because if diplomacy fails, uh, and this is my cynicism <laughs> raising its head, I'm just worried that those, and maybe I put Mr. Bolton in this group, who have advocated for first strike um, so vehemently will then get the upper hand. So the stakes are actually higher uh, than ever. Once you're about, once you commit to entering into negotiation, the stakes are as high as they're going to get. So in that, as I'll, I'll end on a, a high note, if you'd like. I mean, I think um, politics aside, we all have to find a way, if we can, to contribute to trying to make this a success. Um, you know, I would say our Congress, everyone, uh, and uh, try to find a way to reach the solution that we need to get to, to avoid what we all described as a military catastrophe. Well, I think that's a high note. <laughs> it is. Uh, it was well, an empowering it, note. In other words, we get out there and... We're out of time, Jeez. but I want to thank this panel. It, it was a really interesting discussion. And also, it was all women. It was all women, topic, in case you didn't notice that. So. Right? <laughs> um, and thank you.